Become a sustaining member of the Commonwealth Club for just $10 a month. Join today. Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's virtual program of the Commonwealth Club of California. I'm Brian Watt, KQED News anchor in the morning and your moderator for the program. We appreciate your considering a donation to support the Commonwealth Club's work. And if you wish to make one, please click on the blue donate button at the top of the YouTube chat box or visit the club's website at commonwealthclub.org. We also want to remind you to submit questions via the chat room next to your screen, and I'll get to as many as possible later in the program. Seriously, audience questions are welcome, and they make, they make the Commonwealth Club events great. Now, it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished speaker, Erwin Chemerinsky, Dean of the University of California, Berkeley Law School, and author of the new book, Presumed Guilty, How the Supreme Court empowered the police and subverted civil rights. Erwin Chemerinsky is one of the country's most respected constitutional law scholars. And in his new book, he says that rulings by the U.S. Supreme Court have set the table for the kind of policing that led to the deaths of George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, and brought people out into the streets in protest across the country. The Supreme Court has allowed the pe perpetuation of racist policing by presuming that suspects, especially people of color, are guilty before being charged. Dean Chemerinsky argues that the fact that police are nine times more likely to kill black men than other Americans is no accident, but rather the result of an elaborate body of doctrines. He says the pro-defendant Warren Court was only brief historical aberration and that this more liberal era ended with Richard Nixon's presidency and the ascendance of conservative justices whose rulings have permitted stops and frisks, limited suits to reform police departments, even abetted the use of chokeholds. Today, we'll discuss policing in America and hear Dean Erwin Chemerinsky's thoughts on necessary steps to create a more robust court system that will enhance civil rights. Now, welcome Dean Chemerinsky. It's good to see you. Good to see you. Thank you so much for having me on. Absolutely. My first reference point on the issue of what we called back then police brutality is the beating of Rodney King in Los Angeles in 1991. That is when I realized how real and bad police use of force could be, as well as how tricky it can be to prosecute it in court. But you begin your book with a very thorough look at another case that happened in Los Angeles that actually started 15 years early in 1976 and went all the way to the Supreme Court. So what happened to a man named Adolph Lyons and why is his case so important? Adolph Lyons is a 24 year old black man who was stopped by Los Angeles police officers late one night covering a burnt out taillight. The officer ordered Lyons out of his car they slammed his hands above his head under the roof of the car. Lyons complained that the keys that he was holding were cutting into the skin of his palm. The officer thought Lyons was, quote, mouthing off and administered a chokehold on Lyons. The officer literally put his forearm around Lyons' neck and choked until Lyons was unconscious. He awoke. He had urinated and defecated. He was spitting blood and dirt. He was given a traffic ticket and allowed to go. He did some research and discovered at that point, 16 people in Los Angeles had died from police use of the chokehold, almost all like him, black men. He sued the city for an injunction to stop police from using the chokehold, except if necessary to protect the office life or safety. But the Supreme Court ruled five to four 
that Lyons could not sue for an injunction. The court said Lyons could not show that he personally was likely to choke again in the future. The court said if a plaintiff wants an injunction, like Lyons did, the plaintiff has to show a likelihood of future personal harm. No one will ever be able to show that they will be the ones who will be choked again in the future. Well, this is why the chokehold continued, even though it's so dangerous and unconstitutional. It was the chokehold that led to the death of George Floyd, Eric Garner, and many others. Another, a couple of interesting things about this case that I didn't know anything about, not having gone to law school myself. Lyons did not necessarily want a monetary uh, sort of outcome of his suit. That's one thing. It was simply an injunction to prevent what had happened to him from happening to other people. So that's really interesting. The other thing that's interesting here is that he was winning. He actually won in court, uh, Mr. Lyons, in the district court, also in the appeals court. But it's when it got to the Supreme Court that the ruling changed. So what does this say about the Supreme Court as an institution in this case and really in others? Well, I'm glad you mentioned the Court of Appeals decision, because in this case, it stressed how important it was to allow Lyons to have standing so someone could challenge this unconstitutional practice. What the Court of Appeals said was, if Lyons can't sue for an injunction, then no one can, and the chokehold will continue to be used. But the Supreme Court said, it doesn't matter that no one can sue unless a person can show that he or she personally choked again in the future, no suit can be allowed. This has made it very difficult to bring other suits to stop illegal and abusive police practices what does it say about the Supreme Court? I think it says that it's a court that through history, including in this case, has very much sided with law enforcement and has not taken seriously the harms that law enforcement can cause. It is also very interesting to me as someone who did live for a good while in Los Angeles that the Rodney King case and the Lyons case are both Los Angeles cases you have done a lot of work on the Los Angeles Police Department. Has the police department, despite rulings, made reforms that represent some progress in police uh, use of force? It's a complicated story. I don't think it's coincidence that Lyons and the Rodney King beating occurred in Los Angeles. It's a police department that long has had a culture of accepting and even rewarding excessive force by the police. I say in the book that it's a culture that very much exalted Dirty Harry and shunned Serpico, though my children had no idea what I was referring to in saying that. It, after the Rampart scandal in 2000, the Department of Justice said to the city, we have found a pattern and practice of civil rights violations and the city and the Justice Department entered into a over 100 page agreement to reform the LAPD. There was a chief then, Bill Bratton, who came in, committed to enforcing the consent decree. And there was a significant improvement in the LAPD. In fact, I present in the last chapter of the book statistics that show occasions for use of force went down, police killings went down. But there was still a great deal more to be done and it hasn't been, and I think there's been some backsliding there. That's why I say when you talk about the LAPD, you're talking about a very complicated story of a department where the culture really has been one that, as I say in the book, has accepted, even encouraged excess of force. And yet you also write in your book that we, we shouldn't necessarily pick on Los Angeles. It, it could represent, there are other police departments and other places where there is also a pattern, a, a pattern of something bad happening that has, and then, you know, a chain of events that follow that, that, that really has been repeated since the 1950s. What, what is that pattern and with our attitudes and the way we look at police use of force? You're absolutely right. Los Angeles is typical of cities across the country. 
I write about it because it's the city I know most. I did a study of the Los Angeles Police Department after the Rampart scandal. But the Department of Justice has brought suits in cities across the country, from Baltimore to Cincinnati to Seattle to reform police departments, and agreements have been reached. But it's not just these departments where problems exist. There was a lawsuit in New York that documented that the New York police engaged in stop and frisk of black and Latinos, far more than whites, holding every variable constant. We're all familiar with it on in Ferguson, Missouri. So the problem of policing, access of force, and racist policing is a national one, and it's one of longstanding. There is another case that you write about in the book that is very, very significant with regard to the Supreme Court ruling 1968, Terry v. Ohio. So that we can move forward in this discussion, can you explain that case to us and, and why it's so relevant today? Sure. It involves a couple of men in Cleveland who are on a public sidewalk. And they were walking back and forth on the public sidewalk. How often they were going back and forth is in dispute. One of the interesting things about this case, that at each level of appeal, the story was they walked even more times back and forth across the sidewalk. A police officer saw them. It's not coincidence in these stories that the two men were black and the officer was white. The officer thought maybe they were casing the joint to rob it. Now remember, the men had done nothing illegal. They were doing what any of us are allowed to do, walk on a public sidewalk. But the officer then took the men, stopped them, frisked them, found that they had guns, and they were arrested for illegal possession of guns. Mm -hmm. The Fourth Amendment to the Constitution says police are allowed to stop and detain somebody if there's, quote, probable cause that a crime has been committed or is about to be committed. No one would suggest that this rises to the level of probable cause. But the Supreme Court eight to one said, police don't need to have probable cause in order to stop somebody, in order to frisk somebody. So long as there is this amorphous standard, reasonable suspicion, that's enough. And the court found that it was met here. And it's that which has really opened the door to legitimated racial profiling in the United States. And this is a ruling that came from the Warren Court, which you call the most liberal court in American history. What rulings had the Warren Court made that protected the civil rights of criminal defendants and those interacting with police? Indeed, the period of the 1960s, from about 1962 to 1969, was an everyone would agree we had the most liberal Supreme Court in history. We also had the court most willing to protect the rights of criminal suspects and defendants. In terms of what cases, everyone's familiar with Miranda versus Arizona from 1966 that said that when police question a person in custody, the officer has to give warnings. You have the right to remain silent. Anything you say can be used against you. The right to a lawyer, if you can't afford one, one will be provided. It was the Warren Court in 1963 in Gideon versus Wainwright that said that anyone tried for a crime in state court has a right to a lawyer paid for by the government if the defendant can't afford one. It was the Warren Court in Matt versus Ohio that said that if police engage in an illegal search, the evidence gained has to be excluded, can't be used against the defendant. And to me, one of the interesting questions is, why did the Warren Court in 1968 find that the police could engage in stop and frisk? Earl Warren, who wrote Brown versus Board of Education, also wrote the opinion in Terry versus Ohio. Mm. Thurgood Marshall, the greatest civil rights lawyer in history, was part of the majority in that case. Mm. I think a lot was going on. The Warren Court had been tremendously criticized for its decision protecting criminal suspects. It was said it was handcuffing the police. I think it was unwilling to hand down another decision that would receive as handcuffing the police. It was 1968, riots had occurred in many major American cities and more to take place. There was a great deal of tension over crime. Richard Nixon was running for president in 1968 on a platform of law and order 
and ending the war on court and appointing strict constructionists. And I think all of this affected the Supreme Court and explains Terry versus Ohio. I think the other big history lesson that jumps out of your book at me, and I thought I knew a little something about the history of civil rights in the courts, is President Richard Nixon appointed four Supreme Court justices in two years. And, you know, we thought our last president had a lot with three, but, but this would really, really remake the, the Supreme Court. It truly did. He, Richard Nixon had two appointees in 1969, Chief Justice Warren Burger and Justice Harry Blackman, and then two more in 1971. And these were William Rehnquist and Lewis Powell. They dramatically changed the direction of constitutional law. Just today, I was talking to my students about a case in 1973 where the Supreme Court said, there's no right to education under the constitution and there's no protection of the poor from discrimination. It was the four Nixon appointees and a holdover Eisenhower appointee. How different our country would have been had the Supreme Court found a right to equal educational opportunity in 1973. Does the average police officer on the streets know what kinds of powers that Supreme Court rulings have given them? Most definitely. I mentioned the report I did on the Los Angeles Police Department. I interviewed about 80 to 100 police officers. I was very impressed. So many of them told me that the proudest day of their lives is the day they got their badge. And I was also struck by how much they were familiar with the Supreme Court's rulings about things like stops and searches and frisks and interrogation and what they could and couldn't do. I saw another example of this several years ago. The Supreme Court handed down a decision that I feared was going to encourage police to engage in more illegal stops. And the inspector general of a major city police department came to me with his staff and said, since this Supreme Court decision, there's been a tremendous increase in illegal stops. The officers know exactly what the court said and what they can get away with. And this conversation was probably eight months after the Supreme Court decision had come down. One of my colleagues, Charles Weislenberg, studied the videos of police academies and police training. And so police were instructed on how to get around Miranda versus Arizona. Police know the law and what they can and can't do. We have gotten a few questions uh, already from the audience, which we really appreciate. And I'm going to ask one of them right now. Um, can you discuss what major policing reforms across the country have actually been put into place since the death of George Floyd? And which ones need to be implemented still? Sure. A bill was introduced into Congress, in fact, there were a couple of them, passed the House of Representatives, stalled in the Senate. Last year, several bills were introduced into the California legislature. This was after the death of George Floyd to help reform policing in California. None of them got adopted. But some things have been done, sometimes at the local level, occasionally in other states. Examples. A number of cities had now banned police from using the chokehold. It's a chokehold that killed George Floyd. It was after George Floyd's death, for example, that Minneapolis finally prohibited police from choking suspects in order to subdue them. But other cities have done that too. Some cities have adopted, either through city councils or police commissions, bans on the use of, quote, no knock warrants. They required that police knock and announce their presence before entering a dwelling. This is what led to the death of Breonna Taylor. Police entered the dwelling without announcing who they were. The man who's with Breonna Taylor thought that there was a robbery and intruders and he took out his gun. He didn't know it was police officers. The police officer saw the gun and started shooting and Breonna Taylor got killed in the crossfire. And entering a dwelling, especially at night, without knocking and announcing is dangerous for the officers and dangerous for the people in the residence. And some cities have done that. There are many other things that need to be done. Let me just give you examples. Some cities in North Carolina 
have required that police get written consent in order to search. Tremendous decrease in police just being able to say somebody consented just by asking people to give written consent. Some cities, and this is often as a result of consent decrees, require that the police record the race of everyone who they stop. And what we've seen is if we force the police to do that, it will decrease racial profiling. If police know that they're gonna be monitored in terms of the race of who they stop, they're much less likely to use race as the basis for their stops. And this is something that can be done. Now, I think what we need to do also is increase the liability for officers who violate the constitution and for the cities that employ them. And this was part of the bill that was introduced into Congress, but it's stalled in the Senate so far. In our state of California, my colleagues in public radio helped make a thing called the California Reporting Project. This is a coalition to look into police misconduct and the use of force with records that are supposed to be more available under this police transparency law, SB 1421, that we have. And police are releasing those records at a trickle of a pace uh, with a lot of state level legal challenges along the way. Is this law the kind of state action that can be taken that creates the kind of transparency that all states need? Or, or do you feel like it's falling a little short? Oh, I think it's a huge step forward. Let me go back a little bit to Los Angeles. Sure. Prior to the consent decree, Los Angeles had no system for tracking the disciplinary violations of officers. Isn't that amazing that an officer come for discipline and there was no system to know how often that officer had previously been disciplined. And one of the things the consent decree did was create a system to require that the disciplinary history of officers be kept and be tracked. Well, because of a state law that then existed, the Police Officer Bill of Rights, even when there was a disciplinary history, it was almost impossible to be able to obtain it. One of the things that the bill that you did and Senator Nancy Skinner's sponsorship of it did was to say that we should have access to those records and information. But the police unions have fought that transparency as hard as they can every step of the way. But I think it's so important in terms of accountability of these individuals who can take away people's liberty and carry deadly force, even take away people's lives. Mm. In the last section of your book, it's, it's almost like a roadmap, a roadmap. It's like a guide for activists who really, really want to work on police reform. And you do express a great deal of hope that the energy of the moment can really translate into some real reform. But in other parts of the book, you, um, you're pretty blunt with how tough it is out there, with especially with regard to the Supreme Court and even political action. Um, I actually wanted to ask you to go back to chapter two of your book, uh, page 26, and, and just read a little bit of uh, just a passage there on page 26, because um, I feel like, well, there's a lot of passages that I loved in this book that I wish you could read, but there's something about this one that really, really tells us where we are right now. Thank you. We're at a moment, thanks especially to Black Lives Matter, when the pressure to change policing is great. Some even advocate defunding or abolishing the police. Historically though, the political process is not significantly regulated police conduct. Judicial activism and enforcement have usually necessary police reform. One reason is that public pressure generally favors more aggressive law enforcement stop crime, not protection of the rights of suspects and criminal defendants. After all, when was the last time any state or city adopted a law to expand the rights of criminal suspects or criminal defendants? When was the last time a state adopted a law to protect prisoners' rights? As the constitutional law scholar Barry Friedman observes, legislatures avoid regulating the police because they don't see any advantage of doing so. Historically, the political pressure has overwhelmingly been in one direction for aggressive, even overly aggressive law enforcement. 
This has resulted in the country's tremendous over-criminalization. The United States has 5% of the world's population, but 25% of the world's prisoners. So, so this is a very, very pessimistic moment in your book, but several pages later, several pages later, you, you express a certain hope in the reforms. And I really want to talk more about where those reforms can be achieved. We've already talked about some places, um, but you also spend a fair amount of time talking about how state Supreme Courts can make rulings and how they have made rulings that circumvent the United States Supreme Court. Let me start by trying to hope and then talk about the mechanisms for reform. Yes. I signed the contract to write this book in January 2019. Hmm. After the tragic death of George Floyd, my editor said, how soon can you get me the manuscript? Wow. I finished it in the summer and early fall of 2020. And of course, while I was writing this is when protests occurred in literally all 50 states against police violence. It was the first time in history that athletic events got canceled in response to police violence. And this gave me real hope that there was momentum for reform. I saw the bills introduced in the Congress, in the California legislature, and legislatures across the country. I have to admit I'm a bit discouraged that a year later, virtually none of these laws have been adopted. But there is still the opportunity for reform. Where might it come from? Well, it can come from legislatures, from Congress, from state legislatures for their states, from city councils and police commissions at the local level. As you just said, it can come from state Supreme Courts because state Supreme Courts can and often do protect rights even where the Supreme Court says they don't exist under the US Constitution. And it also can come from an enforcement of existing laws. There's a very important federal statute that I've already alluded to that lets the Justice Department sue police departments when there's a pattern and practice of civil rights violations. Jeff Sessions, the Attorney General in the Trump administration, made clear that he was never going to use the statute or enforce agreements under it. But thankfully, the new Attorney General, Merrick Garland, has already said he's going to use this very powerful tool to reform police. So all of these are paths for reform, even if the Supreme Court continues to ignore the problem of racialized policing in the United States. Let me take another question from the audience. How does media coverage shape Supreme Court decisions on policing? I don't know that it does shape Supreme Court decisions with regard to policing. The justices live in our society. The justices certainly see what we do on television. And yet there's not much indication that the justices have been moved to change their approach to policing by what they watch. They saw the Rodney King beating just like you and I did, but it didn't lead to Supreme Court decisions providing greater controls on the police or making it easy to see, sue police for abuses and brutality. It's a court that is ideologically very conservative and one manifestation of that conservatism is it's very pro-law enforcement. I, I think that there is a place in your book, if, I, if I'm remembering it correctly, where you actually go through all of the writings of the, at least the conservative majority that's on the Supreme Court now, and you really find nothing in any of their decisions and any of their legal writings that expresses any concern about the inequities in policing. That's right. If you look at the six conservative justices, there's nothing that any of them has ever said, and that's not hyperbole, that none of them has ever said anything that recognizes the problem of racialized policing in the United States. Hmm. Certainly you find that, say, in the writings of Justice Sonia Sotomayor, and she's talked about the racial inequalities in policing. Well, let me give you another example of the silence of the Supreme Court. We now know that many innocent people were convicted because of false eyewitness identifications. We know of those who have been acquitted later, exonerated, when DNA evidence shows they didn't do it. 
but a large percentage of them had been convicted because of erroneous eyewitness identification. We know from social psychologists that especially cross-racial eyewitness identifications are particularly fallible. This is when somebody's identifying one of a different race. Since 1986, when William Rehnquist became Chief Justice, to today, it's a period of 35 years, there's only been one Supreme Court case dealing with the issue of eyewitness identification, and it found in favor of the police. This is a major problem with law enforcement that we know has led to the conviction of many innocent people, and the Supreme Court has obviously just ignored it. This is actually goes straight into the next question I'm getting from the audience. There is talk in some circles that Supreme Court justices should have term limits. I think this audience member is curious if you believe you, the constitutional law scholar, would alter any rulings on policing. Term limits. The decisions of the Supreme Court are so much a product of the justices and their life experiences. Through American history and now, most of our justices have been privileged, come from privileged backgrounds. Almost all have been white, have been very few justices of color in all of American history. And they bring those experiences, including those perceptions of the police with them. I think if we change the composition of the Supreme Court, we'll change its rulings in this and other areas. So I personally do favor 18 year non-renewable terms for Supreme Court justices. Mm. I do this because, well, in part, life expectancy, thankfully, is a lot longer today than it was in 1787. In 1787, the average life expectancy was 36 years old. Think about the current justices. Clarence Thomas was confirmed in 1991 when he was 43 years old. If he stays on the Supreme Court until he's 90, He'll be on the court as a justice for 47 years. And I picked 90 because that's the age which John Paul Stevens retired. Hmm. Or so it doesn't sound partisan. Elena Kagan was 50 when she was confirmed. If she stays on the court until she is 90, she'll be on the court for 40 years. Or one more example, Amy Coney Barrett was confirmed on October 26. At the time, she was 48 years old. If she stays on the court until she's 87, and there was the age which Justice Ginsburg died, Barrett will be a justice into the year 2059. This is just too much power in any person's hands for too long a period of time. Wow. I, when you cited all of those realities in your book, I read it as the sort of, hey, we need to realize that we can't count on the Supreme Court. It's very important that we start looking for other avenues down which to pursue policing reform. But here you've laid it out <laughs> just in, in, as an argument for limiting the terms of Supreme Court justices. That is very interesting. It's also, we've got to recognize that there is a strong ideological imbalance on the court. Here's a statistic that's also in the book. Between 1960 and 2020, there were 32 years with a Republican president and 28 years with a Democratic president. In fact, in 2024, we'll have had 32 years of each. But since 1960, Republican presidents have appointed 15 justices of the court. Democratic presidents have appointed only eight justices of the court. And Republican presidents have tended to depict very conservative individuals who, as part of that, are very pro-police. All of this adds up to both why I favor term limits, but also as to why you're absolutely right as to my thesis. We can't rely on the Supreme Court. We need to look to those other avenues for police reform. Let's go down to the local avenue for a couple of questions from the audience. Uh, and, and, you know, this is a very statistic specific question. So if you don't know the exact answer, maybe you know something that relates to it. Something tells me you do. Um, what percentage of police departments have people of color as chiefs? And what impact is this having on policing? I don't know the percentage that are people of color chiefs. Um, in terms of the impact on policing, that's very much in dispute. Mm -hmm. Some believe that having a person of color as chief 
can really make a difference. That person then brings the experience of a person of color to the world. Others believe that just having a chief who's a person of color doesn't make a big difference. And certainly in Los Angeles, we've seen both. We've, you know, Bernard Parks, a black man was the chief, but he had come up through the ranks of the Los Angeles Police Department and he was not a reformer chief by any means. I mean, at one point he said to me face to face, until you stand up to the bullet, you have no right to criticize my department. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, Bill Bratton was white, was very committed to police reform. He appointed a constitutional policing advisor, Connie Rice, a black civil rights lawyer to come into the department, which is something almost unheard of. So the race of the chief can matter, but how much I think is in dispute. Another question about sort of law enforcement at the local level. How common is tension between district attorneys and police as it is in San Francisco and Los Angeles? And what impact is this having on policing? Historically, there hasn't been tension between district attorneys and police. In fact, one of the concerns that's long been raised is that district attorneys don't check the police even when they should. And I saw this in my study of the Los Angeles Police Department that district assistant attorneys looked the other way when there was police misconduct rather than expose it. And what I heard as I talked to police and prosecutors was the deputy district attorneys relied on the police every day for the evidence in every case, and they didn't want to have a tense relationship with the police. But now in some cities, there are reform DAs. Um, we certainly saw it in Philadelphia. We see it in Los Angeles, George Gascon, who previously was in San Francisco. We see it with Chase Boudin. And in these cities, there's a real tension between the district attorneys and the police. Take George Gascon as an example. The police union in San Francisco vehemently opposed Gascon being elected district attorney of Los Angeles. Well, why? because there'd been such tension between Gascon wanting to more aggressively investigate things like police use of excess of force and the union being protective. So where we have more progressive DAs, we're also seeing that tension with police. How healthy do you think this tension is? I don't know. I think it's too soon to say. On the one hand, I would hope it's healthy that it's a DA who says, my office is not going to look the other way when there's police excess of force and police misconduct. On the other hand, the DA's office has to work with the police. And if the police aren't cooperating, then law enforcement can't function. Will it be a positive story or will it be a detrimental story or will the reality sum up someplace in between? We're too new in this. I mean, George Gascon just got elected in November. Um, don't know how it's going to all play out in Los Angeles County. He's already being subjected to a recall election, though, by those who believe that he is trying too hard to reform the criminal justice system. I have another question from one of my colleagues on the California Reporting Project. They looked at data in Bakersfield that show Black drivers are significantly more likely to be stopped compared to drivers of other races. Not long ago, the California Reporting Project reported that Bakersfield police have disclosed breaking 46 bones in 31 people and no officer faced discipline for any of those incidents. Now the state attorney general has settled with the Bakersfield police where the department admits no wrongdoing but agrees to change practices over a number of years. What do settlement, settlements like this need to have in order to offer hope for reform? I want to start by saying what you described with regard to Bakersfield is not unique. We've seen the same thing in cities all across the country. If there's going to be a settlement, it has to bring about significant reform. Now, we can talk about many of the things that that involves. I don't know, for example, if there previously had been body cams and dash cams that the police have that they record what's going on and rules that prevent the police from turning them off 
when they want to engage in misconduct. I don't know if Bakersfield is a rule that requires that the police record the race of everyone they stop. Mm -hmm. I don't know how use of force is investigated in Bakersfield or under this consent decree. I don't know who's the disciplinary panels that hear this, but we want to make sure there is an effective disciplinary system. I don't know if there's a tracking system of discipline for officers, but there has to be ultimately a culture in the department that makes that kind of excess of force unacceptable. Until the culture of the department changes, we're not gonna be able to have reforms. Now we then we get to the question, how do you change the culture of the department? I think it's very important that officers be able to report the misconduct of other officers without facing reprisals. I had an incident, and this is now almost 20 years ago, where an officer in the Los Angeles Police Department came into my office. I was a professor at the University of Southern California at the time. And at first I was stunned and worried something happened to one of my children because there's a large man, gun, handcuffs, baton there. And he said, Professor, can I talk to you in confidence? And he told me of some very illegal, disturbing things going in a station house. And he said, I wanna know two things. Who can I tell this anonymously to? Because I worry that if it's known that I reported it the next time I'm in trouble in the field, no one's gonna guard my back. And who can make sure I don't get disciplined because I've known about this for a few months. And technically if I didn't report it at the beginning, I face discipline. Hmm. And with him sitting there, I called the inspector general of Los Angeles Police Department, Jeff Eglash. And thankfully he was there and picked up the phone. And I asked those two questions. And he said, there's no one the officer can talk to anonymously. And there's no one who can protect the officer from discipline. Well, that officer wasn't gonna come forward and report the misconduct. If we're gonna change a department like Bakersfield, we've gotta create the mechanisms where the culture changes, where misconduct can be reported and where it's dealt with severely. Wow. I wanna remind audience members that you can submit questions via the chat room uh, next to your screen. Uh, we have worked through some really, really great questions from the audience so far. Um, another audience member uh, wants to come back to this whole 18 year term limit that you say you are in favor of and ask what avenues larger society might pursue to actually make that a reality. How, how do you impose a term limit on the Supreme Court? I think it would take a constitutional amendment because Article 3 of the Constitution gives Supreme Court justices life tenure. There are some who believe we could do this by a federal statute where the justices would keep their title and salary but stop hearing cases after 18 months. I'm skeptical of that. President Biden does have a commission that's looking at reforming the Supreme Court, it's supposed to issue its report by November. We'll see what it says about term limits. One thing that gives me hope is that there's bipartisan support. Rick Perry, when he ran for governor, when he ran for president, remember he was the conservative governor at Texas at the time, right. supported 18 year non-renewable terms for Supreme Court justices. My worry though is that to amend the constitution takes a great deal of effort. And is there a constituency that cares enough about this issue to put in that work to amend the constitution? Hmm. Well there's also an, uh, a demand for a little bit more specific specificity on the logic behind 18 years. What's What in your mind is magic about the number 18 years? There are nine justices, and if there were 18-year non-rural terms and they were staggered, there'd be a vacancy every two years. Mm. And then every president would get an even an equal ability to change the composition of the Supreme Court. Right. And 18 years also seems to me long enough to allow for the learning curve of being a Supreme Court justice, but yet short enough that no one serving on the court is we're gonna see for three and four decades. Interesting. When you mentioned all that happened sort of in the history of our country from when you were asked to write this book to uh, when you were asked how quickly you could finish this book to when you actually finished it, 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 it made me realize that this time last year, police reform was a very, very, it was front 
and center. And if, if we go 12 months to, to today, we're talking about Afghanistan. The, the Delta variant, we, we could have a housing crisis on our hands that is exacerbated by the pandemic. My question to you is how, how do activists who have really have been focusing on this for a long time, keep police reform front and center? How, how, this energy that made you hopeful that uh, progress can be made, how do you keep that energy alive? I don't know. Attention spans on public issues are short. And the attention span last year, the attention was very much focused on policing. And then it went on to so many other issues. There are people such as the Black Lives Matter movement who are really dedicating their careers and their lives to this. And we need to follow their lead. We need to continue to push city councils, state legislatures, Congress to adopt legislation. My pessimistic fear, it's gonna take the next George Floyd incident or Michael Brown incident. Michael Brown was the person killed by the police in Ferguson, Missouri. And there will be another, and it will take something like that to then revitalize the movement. But why should it take more people, more black men dying in order to finally get something done? You do not dance around the notions of defunding or abolishing the police. You acknowledge that this is a big argument that is being made by a number of activists, but you do conclude that we need the police. I Why? <laughs> I understand the impulse to say, let's abolish the police. And people I respect, including my colleagues here at Berkeley Law, would argue for it, but it's not realistic or reasonable. Every society needs law enforcement. Every society needs to have some criminal statutes and needs to have them enforced. And the reality is if somehow we abolish the police, then those with money would just hire private security forces. We wouldn't eliminate policing and those private security forces wouldn't have to comply with the constitution because they're not the government. I think we'd end up much worse off. I'm also struck by opinion poll after opinion poll shows that even in communities of color, maybe especially in communities of color, there's not support for abolishing the police because of the recognition of the need for police in certain circumstances. Now, defunding the police might mean abolishing them, in which case I don't think that's realistic or reasonable. But I do think there are things that we've traditionally asked the police to do that we might turn to other social service agencies to provide. Some of the mental health services that police have provided. Berkeley is considering the idea of instead of having police enforce traffic laws, have other unarmed individuals enforce the laws about speeding or stopping at stop signs to decrease the chances of violence. And those are the kind of things I think we need to explore, but it's very different than abolishing the police. Yeah, I, what I found very interesting is the way you look at your own campus and the considerations on the campus of UC Berkeley, uh, thinking about getting rid of campus police. Oh. <laughs> In the spring of 2020, after the death of George Floyd, a group of our students felt very strongly that the campus police should be abolished. And they asked me to join them in a letter to urge the chancellor to abolish campus police. And I said, I can sign your letter and endorse it for many of the reforms you call on the chancellor to impose, but I can't support abolishing the campus police. If there were no campus police, then the campus would rely exclusively on the Berkeley City Police and the Alameda County Sheriff. And having been a professor on a lot of campuses for a long time, I realized that the students are often much better off having campus police rather than having the city or the sheriffs involved. Um, the students were very, who were act, ad, advocating this were quite upset with me and continue to criticize me, but I still believe there has to be a law enforcement presence and the students are better off with a campus police than just relying on the city or the sheriffs. In a strange way, this reminds me of something else that you write in this book that I think is important because it really gets at the 
the different philosophies that can govern uh, the minds of people who wind up on the Supreme Court. You write, we are highly unlikely to ever know the specific intentions of the framers of the Constitution, and even if we did, I doubt they would have much relevance for judicial decision-making today. What are, you, what are you trying to explain here about the Constitution and policing as we know it today? We can't explain the Supreme Court's decisions by just saying they were following the framers' intent in 1787 or 1791. One of the things I wanna do in this book is trace the history of policing in the United States. What many people don't realize is organized police forces as we know of them didn't exist until after the mid 19th century. In fact, the first organized police forces that exist were slave patrols where they existed to round up escaped fugitive slaves and bring them back to their owner. And it wasn't until after the civil war that cities began to develop police departments with officers and uniforms and training. Before that, there might be a sheriff or a marshal who would just round up a posse when it was necessary to get somebody. So I think to say, let's go back and follow what the framers intended, it's meaningless because the framers couldn't have understood the world we live in and hear how policing is done today. So let's go off the topic of police reform. And I have to ask you about the very, very hot political topic in the state of California right now. And that is the recall election. Coming up here in just two weeks, you wrote an op-ed in the New York Times saying that it is basically unconstitutional as an idea. A lawsuit was filed to block this election, but just Friday, a few days ago, a federal judge rejected the suit in a ruling. So what was your argument about why it's unconstitutional? And, and what do you think of the judge's argument? I wrote this out bad and also went on the LA Times with my colleague, Aaron Edlin. And our concern is that if Gavin Newsom is recalled, there'll be probably 48 or 49 percent of the voters who want him to stay in office. The opinion polls show that on the question whether he's recalled, it's gonna be very close. If he is recalled, then the candidate who gets the most votes on the second question on the ballot becomes governor. Under the most recent polls I've seen, the candidate who's leading there has 18% of the vote. And so what we face is the possibility that 48 or 49% of the voters want Gavin Newsom to stay governor, 18% of the voters want the alternative, and yet that's the person who'll be governor. And our argument is that's unconstitutional as well as unwise. The lawsuit filed in Los Angeles in federal district was not on this theory. Mm. It was on a different legal theory. And on Friday, a federal district court judge, Michael Fitzgerald, rejected that lawsuit. Mm. Aaron and I had nothing to do with the lawsuit. Got it. it didn't track what we had argued for. I see. So I, you know, the articles that I've read about this ruling um, from Judge Fitzgerald is they note that he's an Obama appointee. They also note that the plaintiff plans to appeal to the Ninth Circuit. Do you think the Ninth Circuit could see this differently? What is your prediction? I should also mention, in addition to being an Obama appointee, Judge Fitzgerald is a Berkeley Law graduate and alum of my law school. All right. Um, very proud of the alums who've gone on to the bench. Um, I wish that the lawyers who had brought this suit had focused it differently. I think there is a stronger argument than the one that they've made, mm. but they didn't call and ask my or Aaron's opinion and um, it will go to the Ninth Circuit. Um, and you know, I've heard the possibility of other lawsuits being filed. It's getting late now, as you say, the recall is September 14th, just two weeks away. Right. Wow. Uh, I have another question from the audience. Is there any relationship between domestic terrorist threats and improper policing? And how has this translated to court decisions? And are you concerned about this? Yes. After 9-11, Congress passed a statute, the Patriot Act, that substantially expanded the powers of law enforcement to gather information 
without following the usual constitutional procedures. So the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act has been amended to greatly expand the powers of the National Security Agency to gather information without following usual constitutional procedures. Now, this additional power has come primarily, if not almost exclusively, at the national level, not at the local level. I am very troubled by it and would be glad to talk about it, though it's not the focus of this book. Right, absolutely. Do you feel like that it it's always going to be an uphill battle because I do think that the average citizen citizen just wants to know that the crime rate is low and doesn't really, really encounter police in this way on a daily basis or a weekly basis. And as long as they know that crime rates are low, it's going to be hard to sort of change their opinion and therefore the political pressure that might get put on a court or well not necessarily a court but uh, a, a body that is trying to make a, a change in policy are you worried that this is that just this basic level of safety is always going to prevail in 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 public opinion over the rights of individuals who encounter police i'm very worried I think it accounts for the tremendous overcriminalization in the United States. Go back to the statistic, you heard me read. This country is 5% of the world's population and 25% of the world's prisoners. And of course, when you look at who's incarcerated, it is so disproportionately people of color. And yet my hope is that there's the recognition that we can be safe without excess of police force. We can be safe without the abuses that we know occur. Let me give an example. In New York, there was a lawsuit brought about stop and frisk, and I present all the statistics in the book, about how overwhelmingly the police used race in deciding who to stop and frisk. As a result of a settlement of a lawsuit, the New York police can no longer engage in stop and frisk. Tremendous decrease in the ability of the police and the actuality of the police stopping people no increase in crime when stop and frisk was eliminated. That to me says we can control the police abuses without making the society more dangerous. Hmm. Very interesting. Wow, uh, you're, you're giving us all a lot to think about. Um, I'm still reminding audience members, we have a few minutes left. If you have any questions that you would like to put to Dean Erwin Chemerinsky, of the UC Berkeley School of Law. Um, I, I, you're so efficient in answering questions. Um, I thought I had a lot of them for you. And I, can I ask you a little bit about where voting rights are going in this country? Because that's another hot topic on the national stage. And, you know, it's, it's a very, very complicated issue in the little time we have left. But. Sure. Um, and there's a relationship between voting rights and controlling the police. If people of color who are disproportionately victims of police abuses don't have their share of the political power because of voter suppression, it becomes all the less likely that there'll be political reforms of policing. And unfortunately, the Supreme Court has gutted the key statute that exists to protect voting rights. The Voting Rights Act of 1965, which I regard as the most important federal laws adopted in my lifetime, did two things. First, it said that jurisdictions with a history of race discrimination in voting had to get pre-approval, pre-clearance before changing their election systems. And this was used to block hundreds of changes that are racially discriminatory effect. But in 2013, in a case called Shelby County versus Holder, the Supreme Court declared those provisions unconstitutional. No longer does preclearance exist. But Chief Justice Roberts' opinion said, don't worry, there's another part of the Voting Rights Act. The second thing it did was to make it possible to sue state and local governments if they had election systems that had a discriminatory effect against minority voters. And again, this has historically been used to stop discriminatory laws. On July 1st of this year, in a case called 
Brnovich versus Democratic National Committee, the Supreme Court made it almost impossible to bring successful suits under that. It was a 6-3 decision with the six Republican appointed justice in the majority, Justice Alito writing, and Justice Kagan authoring a impassioned dissent drawn by Justice Breyer and Sotomayor. Here's why this matters. We're seeing in many states laws being adopted that unquestionably will have a racially discriminatory effect. Look at the laws adopted in Georgia, in Florida, now in Texas and other states. The hope was that they could be challenged as violating the Voting Rights Act. But given what the Supreme Court has done to the Voting Rights Act, successful challenges are gonna be enormously difficult and maybe impossible. Uh, an audience member asks a very interesting question. If you could, if you could currently argue a police, policing case before the Supreme Court, which case would it be? Well, I'm not sure if they say if I could re-argue a case and change a case, what it would be, or where I would want to argue a case in the future to change the law. Because you know there are a lot of precedents that I talk about in the book. Right. That, I would want to undo. Mm -hmm. There's a case called Wren versus United States that makes it possible for the police to stop any driver at any time. All the police have to do is follow the driver until the driver turns without a turn signal or goes a mile over the speed limit, right. or doesn't stop at the stop sign long enough. And the Supreme Court says it doesn't matter if the police officer's motive was racial, doesn't matter the traffic stop was pretextual, the police can do that. I want to see the Supreme Court overrule Wren. In terms of cases in the future, I'd like the Supreme Court to change what's a technical legal doctrine called qualified immunity. Qualified immunity makes it very difficult to sue police officers. In fact, I filed a petition for review in the Supreme Court in the spring of 2020 to ask them to change aspects of qualified immunity. And the court denied review in that and about a dozen other cases. But my hope is the court will do that in the future. My hope is, I alluded to earlier, the court will take cases in the future to deal with the problem of false eyewitness identifications. The court's ignored that problem for the last 35 years. And we're talking about innocent people being convicted, even put to death based on false eyewitness identifications and the court doing nothing about it. What was the first case you argued in front of the Supreme Court? The case was Lockyer versus Andrade. I argued it in November of 2002. My client, Leandro Andrade, had been sentenced to 50 years to life in prison. No possibility of parole for 50 years for stealing $153 worth of videotapes from Kmart stores in San Bernardino, California. He received that sentence even though he'd never committed a violent crime. He received that sentence even though prior to California's three strikes law, no one in the history of the United States had ever received a life sentence for shoplifting. I argued his case in the Federal Court of Appeals and I won. The Federal Court of Appeals, the Ninth Circuit said, the sentence was cruel and unusual punishment, 50 years for shoplifting. I lost in the Supreme Court five to four with the court emphasizing the ability of states to decide the punishment for crimes. And here we are today. So that very, very interesting way to start a career in front of the Supreme Court. Another audience person would like to know if you were picking a Supreme Court justice, what would be the quality you would seek above all others? As with anything, there isn't a quality. There's many qualities. I'd obviously want a person of great intelligence. I'd want a person of great empathy and humanity. I want a person with a wide range of life experiences, not a narrow range of life experiences. Thurgood Marshall, Ruth Bader Ginsburg were so important on the court because of what they'd experienced and seen in their lives. Some of the more recent justices have had a path that's far narrower than that. But I, I want our justices to have a real humanity. And that's what I think has been missing too often on the current court and the court historically. Dean Erwin Chemerinsky of the University of California, Berkeley Law School. Thank you very much. Oh, thank you for doing this conversation. Truly my great pleasure. Dean Chemerinsky is the author of the new book, 
presumed guilty, how the Supreme Court empowered the police and subverted civil rights. We want to remind you that Dean Chemerinsky's book is available online and at your local bookstore. And we also thank all of our viewers, everyone who submitted a question. It was fantastic. My name is Brian Watt, and now this virtual program of the Commonwealth Club of California is adjourned.